Come Internet, so a psychologist's casual review. And today we're going to be reviewing Karen Horney's The Neurotic Personality of Our Time. Well, the book was written in the 30s. So it's the neurotic personality in fairy of the 30s, but that's why it becomes very interesting. If it was written last week, I would have completely bought into it because basically it has remained very accurate to modern day. It has aged incredibly well. And except for the vocabulary, because we wouldn't call people neurotic anymore, or not at least in the mainstream of psychology, but it would still be, but what she's saying is still very, very, very relevant. So what is she saying? So basically, Karen Horney is in this book going to talk about what she calls the neurotics, which basically you can see it as people who have mental disorders, but who have not broken down into a form of psychosis. I mean, there's no delirium, there's no delusions, there's no hallucinations. It's everything but that. Of course, reading the book, you have to be, in, you have to be forgiven because she's writing at a point in time where there was no personality disorders per se. Everything was lumped in into neurosis. So there, there you go. That's the little, how can I say, caveat you have to take into it. You have to take it with a pinch of salt in terms of vocabulary. But what the book states is incredibly interesting and is very, very, very relevant. So in this book, she says that basically people who have neurosis often have deep, a deep sense of emptiness and of basically of guilt and also a form of illegitimacy, that they feel illegitimate. And that basically they often seek power, prestige and social desirable stuff, like for example, a good job, a good marriage, a nice house in a cozy area, uh, good friends, a good network. All of that is having. Basically, they want to have. That have is there to, in a way, compensate what there are not. Because that's why it becomes interesting, is that she basically explains throughout her book, maybe not with those words exactly, but the idea is that basically... These people are mixing up being, being who you are with having. Basically, they, they're so hard-pressed. They have been so traumatized by the fact that the parents were not able to give a sense of security to them as infants. Basically, they were always in a state of insecurity. So they being were not able to develop or develop to the point where they were secure enough with it. So that insecurity manifests with the fact that they want power, they want prestige. They want all those things to validate their existence. And that's a very, very important thing because she does speak about that in her book. And she does elaborate a lot that how basically having is a decoy for existing in a way. And that basically that switch can only operate so far because you can't replace feeling something, being who you are with what you have. Never doesn't work like that and at some breaking point they're gonna start having mental suffering and basically the idea is that that mental suffering can be helped through the psychotherapy and most notably psychoanalysis as Karen Horney was a psychoanalyst so basically the whole point of that book is to say that basically that seek that research of power prestige is basically a search that is doomed from the start not because the quest for those things is wrong, not at all, but it comes from the wrong place in a way, because it, in a way it comes from a place where the of vulnerability. It's I am vulnerable, therefore I want it to be not vulnerable anymore. Whereas she said, if it's non-neurotic and non-psychotic, if it's normal, quote unquote, even if I don't like the term, or let's say standard. Yes, I prefer standard. So let's say standard. If it's standard, basically. The idea is you're going to seek that, but not because you want to use it or to protect yourself or hurt others, but because you can seek it and you can do stuff with it that you want to do. It's not a way of like using it for you. It's more like a way of a mean, an ends to a mean in a way. A means to an end. Yes, that's, that's better. Anyway, it's a means to an end. And basically, 
It's not something to be afraid of. Whereas for the neurotic, it's only a form of self-protection. Even if it's going to hurt others, it's like to protect themselves. And that protection basically means that those things can never truly be acquired. There's always going to be more. There's always going to be a need to be in that socially desirable space. And in a way, she does talk about what she calls the facade, which is the union persona. And she does state so in a, in a footnote. And I'll be referring it to as the persona, because that's what I feel comfortable with, but she calls it the facade, so just for you to know. And that persona basically is going to take the forefront for the neurotic. But what the neurotic really seeks is love and care and affection, a way of being true, both to himself and to others. But the neurotic can't do that, because he's afraid of being, in a way, rejected, hurt, or even destroyed by others. So therefore, he has to go through hoops of putting defenses upon defenses upon defenses, meaning that he becomes disingenuous to others, but also to himself, in order to protect. But that protection is very limited. It doesn't offer as much as it takes away. And that's what she tries to say, is that basically it creates a whole set of anxieties that have to be dealt with, and that might have worked in childhood to protect the infant from insufficient parents, or at least an insufficient environment, that no longer works in adulthood. And basically, it's the person is going to tire themselves and their families and their friends and their whole environment because of that strain on mental illness. And that's another thing that I found very interesting in reading it, because in my head it clicked that for those neurotics, because she does give many examples, but those very neurotics that intertwine, be in and having, and replace one by the other. Well, basically, I really felt that she was talking about people who have fears of abandonment, and she does call them like that. Nowadays, we would call them borderline, even though, as you know, I don't particularly like diagnosis because I don't think that it represents everything. I do feel that she was really speaking about those people that were so afraid to be in a bond, to lose the other, because there are massive amounts of anguish toward the relationship and toward abandonment that she was really talking about themselves. And I really found it brilliant. Like the book in itself, as I stated, it's something, there's something to be said in between the fact that it's been virtually written eight years ago and it's still brilliant. Like, I mean, I have no notes. It's really, really interesting. And another thing that I really liked is that she criticizes Freud between, with a real subtlety and it was a real way of doing it. What I mean by it is that basically she does say she disagrees with Freud on a lot of things. For example, the idea that culture doesn't really play a role, that it's the drives that influence culture. Well, she does not, she disagrees with that. She thinks that culture influences the drives, not necessarily the core drives, but how they express themselves, how they manifest. And that basically, our neurotics that we have, or the people that suffer from mental illness, are also shaped by the society we have. And even though she doesn't, she never goes into criticism of capitalism, because I think that that was not her goal, but reading it now, clearly one can see that, yes, the competitiveness of capitalism does breed the problems. And she does talk about competitiveness in the book, that at, at a level that's so massive, we all have to compete, we all have to outshine the others. And it does cause mental illness. It's not human nature, so to speak. It's not natural. It's something that's hard and complicated. And the fact that society overexerts that tendency to compete, that tendency to rivalry, is a bad thing. And that's something that can create mental illness. And neurosis for Karen Horney, or what we would call now mental disorders, and that's what I found very interesting, is that it, it's really a good read. And even for the layman, it's, she, she does not write at all in the idea of being only understood by professionals. She wrote also for the public. And that's what I found very interesting, is that it's a good read. If you're interested in how mental processes work, how the mind works, how people can do things that are irrational, or complicated. I think that that's a very good read. It's also a very good read 
in order to understand a bit of how all of humans work. Because that's another thing. It's not because neurotics or people who have disorders have those disorders and are in intense suffering that they're the only ones that have it. Everyone, even if they don't have no disorders, do sometimes have seek power or seek prestige or seek something or are afraid of rejection. Those are not illnesses in themselves. It's the, the greed that makes them complicated and it's the suffering that's involved. So even though it's different degrees, everyone has that. And I think that if you're even interested in yourself, it can be a good book and a good starting point for self-reflection as she does give a lot of examples and she does tell the, le the reader that basically he's also concerned by what she's writing. And I have no counter arguments. I completely agree with that, that I and the whole of humanity cannot also be concerned with that. And that's a very interesting point. And that's something that I really appreciated, that she's not trying to um, stigmatize the people she's writing about, but on the contrary, put them in the whole, saying in the whole, meaning the globality of everything. She puts them with everyone else, like we're all struggling. And that's something I really appreciated within her writing. Also, another little thing that I really liked is that basically the author, I mean, I'm going a bit beyond the book, but the author is also someone that I think had very good and very interesting ideas concerning psychoanalysis. Things that I might talk about at another point in more detail, but things like room envy, in contrast with pe penis envy from Freud, and I think that she had a lot of interesting and brilliant ideas. And basically, I find it sad that she's kind of been brushed aside in ma mainstream psychoanalysis when she really did a lot to both popularize psychoanalysis and give it a new life, give it a life beyond Freud. Because that's the other thing with Horny is that she opened psychoanalysis to the cultural, to the society, that it's not just in a subjective it's interper it's interpersonal, but also the per the individual to the society. It's systemic also, and I think that she really opened the door to that. So I hope you liked the review. I would really give it a read if you're interested in any form of psychology, as she writes incredibly well, and she's she's just very good at what she does. Explaining is really her forte. So. If you ever want to leave a comment, feel free, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya. Bye.